Awesome. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so um, thanks so much, Abney, for that awesome, inspiring talk. So up next, we have five amazing speakers. They're going to be sharing product stories in 10-minute lightning talk format. And um, I'm just so excited that you can all be here to like, listen to their stories. So our first speaker is Connie Chan. Connie is a partner at Andreessen Horowitz, where she helps and works with startups. So since 2011, she's been working with, um, start, with Andreessen Horowitz and like, has spearheaded their Asia initiatives and their Asia network. Connie's writing has received a lot of rave reviews, particularly on innovation in China. She won a Sydney Award for her article on WeChat recently. And prior to Andreessen Horowitz, she worked at HP, where she led the launch of its WebOS in China. So we're really excited to have Connie here. She's going to share, talk about apps as superpowers. Um, and then right after Connie, our second speaker of the day is um, uh, Naomi Gleit. She's a VP of product and VP of social good at Facebook. So Naomi, uh, there's an interesting fact about her where uh, she was on the founding team of Facebook growth and she helped grow Facebook's user base from 1 million users to over 2 billion today. Today, Naomi's teams work on tools like um, safety check, community help, and basically these are all important ways to help people connect with each other and help each other in terms of crises and natural disasters. And so Naomi's gonna share with us what it took to scale social good to over 2 billion users. And then our third speaker of the day is uh, really interesting. She's uh, Shamreed Benier. She worked, she's a senior director of product at YouTube. So she joined Google eight years ago and has worked on iconic products. So Google Plus, Groups, she's worked on um, Google Docs as well. And then she joined YouTube about three years ago or three and a half years ago. And um, she launched the YouTube Kids app. From there today, uh, Shamreed works on, she's a PM lead for community at YouTube where she's working on connecting creators and fans together. And then our fourth speaker of the day, I promise there's, there's two more. Uh, fourth speaker of the day is Jess Lee. Jess is a partner at Sequoia Capital. Um, Jess held, previously held leadership positions at Yahoo and Polybor. And there's a really fun story about how she got started at Polybor as its first product manager. So she reached out to the co-founder, sent him a lot of feedback on bugs and issues that she found on the website. Uh, she's offered a role as PM. And from there, she was named its first, its, um, well, VP of product. And then she was named honorary co-founder at Polybor and eventually CEO. Um, and Jess, eventually, like, she led Polywar until his eventual sale to Yahoo in 2015. So we're very glad that Jess can be here. And she's going to talk about the journey from PM to CEO. And then finally, last but not least, our uh, last speaker of the day is Sandra Lu Wong. Sandra is head of product and acting head of engineering at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So she's been involved in companies at the very earliest stages. She's worked at Google, at Facebook in the early stages, and even at Quora most recently, where she was head of product. So Sandra is going to share her uh, lessons learned and her experiences in mentoring PMs and in building out the product function. So those were sort of some of our speakers for the lightning talks. So to kick us off today, I'm going to invite Connie Chan on stage to share acts as superpowers. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Connie. I spend a lot of time thinking about China and Asia, where I look for new interesting products and business models and try and process which ones might have a chance of making it here to the States. Over the last couple of years, as I've studied different companies in China, two reoccurring product themes have come up over and over again when I look at the really successful winners. So there are two product principles that I see in China that are working that I want to share with you here today. The first is this, the rise of the super app. What is a super app? A super app is something that mixes and mashes a bunch of seemingly unrelated services together in one application. Now, WeChat is often the poster child of this concept. I've even written about WeChat as the one app that rules them all. But the reality is China actually has many examples 
of successful super apps. Let's take a look at Alipay. This is China's dominant mobile provider for payments. This is what the dashboard looks like. In fact, it's only two-thirds of the dashboard. I didn't take the full screenshot. And if you look at it, it can look overwhelming. There are so many different services mashed into this one application. And there's a whole section, if you look on the right, for third-party services. So you can actually use your Alipay app to buy movie tickets, train tickets, you can go book an Uber, you can go book an Airbnb. Alipay uses a partnership model where they introduce third-party services into their app so that their app can help users accomplish more things. Here's another example. Gojek is a transportation app that does extremely well in Indonesia. But oftentimes, the media covers it as just that, a transportation app. But when you look at what the Gojek app actually looks like, it's 12 apps mashed into one. Look on the screen on the left. Gojek will cover transportation, yes, but they also do food delivery, grocery delivery, beauty. If you look for their car services, they do car washes, car polishes. You can do 24-hour pharmacy delivery. You can do moving services, shipping services. You can even buy event tickets. Each one of these little squares on that first dashboard in the States would warrant an app of their own. But in Asia, they mash it all together in one app so that this one app can serve the user for a number of use cases. And it's even better because they're logged into everything and their payment credentials are already stored so they don't have to re-input payment every time they try a new service. This is another example of a super app. I remember sharing Gojek and Alipay with a Western designer in Silicon Valley last year. He was talking about the design, and he thought it was awful. He looked at the squares, and he was like, there are these logos, and there's these icons that are too colorful, and there's too many colors, and then there's these words, and I can't figure out what's going on, and navigation is just way too difficult. Well, then I said, it kind of reminds me of my iPhone home screen. It's not that different. You see, when you use this phrase, app as an operating system, you'll understand the mindset that so many Chinese and so many Asian companies have, which is let me be the app that can encompass all the services and needs of my users so they don't have to ever leave my app. In fact, navigating through WeChat or Alipay or Baidu Maps is actually sometimes easier than my iPhone home screen because I don't have to even press the home button. I'm one click away from everything. I'm signed into everything. My payments are stored for everything. This is what the super app concept is, and this is the secret. This is the secret of so many Chinese companies. Sharing distribution, sharing your traffic, will help you retain mind share and help you retain relevance. I'll repeat that again. The secret for so many Chinese apps that you hear about, the Tencent, the Alibaba, is sharing their user base and sharing their traffic to retain mindshare and relevance. So when I think about what would the example look like in the States, the best example I could think of was Craigslist, where I'm mashing together personals, job ads, rental listings, things for sale. But I kept thinking, if Craigslist was in China, they long ago would have added a number of other transactions, either built by themselves or through partnerships. That's the way the Chinese apps think. They all focus on super apps. So super app is the first theme I see over and over in Asia. The second theme I see a lot of is what mobile first really looks like. This phrase, mobile first, might be difficult to explain at first because you think, well, we here in the States, we're mobile first too. We're on our smartphones all day long, every single day. But the more time you'll spend in Asia and in other developing countries, you'll see that they think about mobile first in a very different way. Again, WeChat is often used as the poster child for this phrase. And they talk about how in China you can use WeChat everything. You don't ever have to leave this app. You can use this app to connect with businesses, to complete your payments, to chat with everyone you need. But as I was thinking about that definition for using WeChat as mobile first, it didn't sit right. Because again, that's really actually going back to that super app concept, where you mash a bunch of things into one, and where you allow access and breadth of services. In my mind, what makes WeChat mobile first 
is that they have completely unshackled themselves from the constraints of designing for a PC. And they utilize features that are mobile specific, that are specific to mobile hardware. So for example, back in 2011, when WeChat first launched, they had a really fun feature that was very popular in China at the time. It was called Shake Shake. You would shake your phone, and basically anyone else who shook their phone within a certain radius, you'd be matched up with. And you can have a conversation with a stranger. This shaking concept was really fun and novel, and is something that you cannot do on a PC, but is very easy to do on the mobile. WeChat was using the accelerometer. Interestingly, too, they use the compass, they use the GPS, they use the camera in very novel ways. There's another cloud storage app in China who also used the shaking feature. They had a fun feature where if users would go in and play this game and shake their phones, they could win an extra two megabytes of storage. A very inconsequential amount, but it was fantastic for user engagement and getting users to come back into their app. So mobile first to me now takes on a different definition. And it's not about me spending the majority of my day using my phone versus my PC. It's about designing for mobile first, knowing all the different sensors and all the different um, abilities that smartphones allow you to have. There's this phrase one of my colleagues taught me two years ago that helps me encapsulate this concept, which is use every part of the buffalo. She told me this story about how Native Americans, when they had to kill a buffalo, they made sure that nothing went to waste. That buffalo's potential was absolutely maximized. Because in addition to using the meat for food, they would also use the bones for arrowhead and glue. They would use the gallstones for paint. In fact, they could save the tongues to become hairbrushes or the tails to become fly swatters. They used every single part of the buffalo. And similarly, when Chinese developers think about app design, they use every part of the smartphone. They even think about the camera differently. So let me give you an example of that. When they're using the camera, it's not about taking a photo. Yes, that happens, of course. Chinese people, we love selfies too. But they're also using the camera for data input. And that happens all the time. I'm sure you've read about some articles where you hear that China's becoming a cashless society. Mobile payments is taking off there. You can go two, three weeks and never have to use the credit card, nor take out cash. But did you know that all that mobile payment, all of that's happening with the camera. It's not happening with NFC. It's not happening with a smart chip. They're using their camera to scan a QR code to complete a payment. They'll also use cameras in other novel ways. Years ago in China, I could already use the camera to scan a book cover and get a review of a book. I could already use it to scan a water bottle and reorder that same water bottle. They're using the camera as data input, not just data capture of an image. It's a different mindset of how to utilize smartphone, how to really, truly be mobile first. So why do these concepts matter? Super app and mobile first. I believe, like Wayne Gretzky said, you have to skate where the puck is going. And I have a thesis that a lot of consumer mobile trends that we see in China today will start playing out in the US in one or two years. And so if that's the case, then think about this concept of soup wrap, one app to rule them all, and ask yourself, how can we utilize our existing audience and share with them services that might seem unrelated to what we're doing in our core business? that those users want to access anyways. This way, at least they'll stay in our app. They'll be using our payment services. And I can introduce them to other interesting things. And second, mobile first. What does that really mean? I think it means unshackling yourself from the constraints of a PC. Don't worry that your mobile app can do more than what your PC version can do. In fact, I think that's a fantastic thing. Think about what your app can do that's not possible on the PC because the world is heading towards mobile. I'll leave you with one final story. A couple of years ago, I was using the app JD.com, um, Jingdong, which is basically considered the Amazon of China. It's a shopping site, an e-commerce site. And they added a tab for games. 
where you're not buying games and board games to ship to your house. You're, you're literally going there to play web games with other users. And to me, this was weird. This was a couple of years ago, and I couldn't figure out why an e-commerce site would have a whole section when users would go there to play games. And so I asked friends in China why they would do something like this, and I got answers back like, well, those users would be playing those games anyways. At least now they're doing it within our website, and maybe they'll take a break in between games and buy something. And I also got the answer, well, why not? And that's the conclusion that I get to more often than not now when I study cross-border innovation and product ideas in China. Why not? So I hope I've left you with a little bit of inspiration to also come to that same conclusion and use an open mindset. When you think about these apps, and you think about super app and mobile first, and how you can use these concepts to unleash your creativity. Thank you. Thanks, now we have Q&A. Sure. Uh, so the question was, how do you think about the ramifications of a monopoly type mentality where you're using one app to access all of these other services? And I think that's a great question. Um, because it is starting to become the case that in China you can be using WeChat for hours a day. Four, five, six hours. And, and in China, rather than using Slack, you're using WeChat at work too. So it really can extend to eight plus hours a day. Um, and the answer is I think these platforms have to really think about how they're storing user data and how they're working with third-party developers and how they're working with third-party partners. So for example, WeChat, when they do a lot of these transactions, they're not actually storing all of the information on their servers. A lot of that only that third-party developer can see. So if I'm using WeChat to access a business, for example, I'm basically going to the business's website, but it's wrapped in the WeChat shell. And so this way, from a user perspective, I have the ease of not having to log in or write in new payment credentials, but everything else I'm doing, it's happening directly with the business. Cross-border innovation. OK. Um, I like the idea of having cross-border innovation. I'm wondering if you have seen cultural differences that might lead to things working in China or in general, Eastern culture not working in Western culture. Oh, definitely. Specifically, the balance between focus and something that might be interpreted as distraction. Well, I think there are a lot of cultural differences between East and West. And so I definitely put on a cultural filter when I'm trying to think about which products or ideas work there that might not work here. And a lot of it has to do with user demographics and just society. The makeup is quite different. So, I mean, for example, the one child policy was in place for well over 30, 30 years, right? And so when everyone's an only child, they are going to prioritize education differently. They're going to prioritize um, baby products differently. And they're going to have to deal with a lot more feelings of loneliness that might not necessarily happen here in the West. So there's a lot of cultural differences when you look at cross-border innovation. But these concepts of super app and mobile first, I think these two concepts can be universal. Um, especially the super app one. Now if you even look at the numbers, even in the West, our expectations of what an app needs to achieve and accomplish for us in order for us to go download a new app, they're higher than they were years ago. And so for apps to stay relevant, if they only have one feature, it's going to be increasingly harder. And they're going to need to introduce new services. And whether or not they choose to build them themselves or partner with another company, I think you're going to see more of the super app concept come here in the West. 
Okay, great. Um, how do you think that uh, companies should be, uh, US-based companies should be getting ahead of this super app concept? Um, if it seems like now, at least the American mindset is very used to these distinct modules. Right. Um, like you look at Uber and it opened up its separate app um, under Uber Eats. And at first it was kind of weird. It was like, oh, why do I want to buy food from somewhere that I get a car? <laughs> um, like, so how should other companies be approaching that? Yeah. I mean, that concept, that very example of Uber and Uber Eats, that would not happen in China. It would 100% be in one app. And this whole idea of constellation theory of apps, where you have a family, a suite of apps, I think is a very Western way of looking at app distribution. Uh, when I talk to some Western companies, I get different answers on this. Some people say it's more clear to the end user. This is what I'm using that app for. Some people tell me it's because organizationally, a lot of these tech, co tech companies would rather structure different teams around different apps rather than having everyone to work on one app and one major app launch. So I think there's different reasons for why it happens here. Um, in China, I think because there's so much competition, people oftentimes will mash things into one app because you're spending double the customer acquisition costs if you have to have two different apps out there. And you're exposing yourself, therefore, to more competition down the line. For a company here, though, to really embrace it, it's quite difficult because you need a lot of different uh, stakeholders to agree. You might need your corporate development team to be on board so they make investments in partnerships so those companies have financial stakes into working together with you as a distribution partner. And you might need your top level management to agree that these things should all be meshed together. But I do think this is the trend that we're going to start seeing in the West. We already can see some examples where the apps that we're so used to are introducing new features that are somewhat unrelated to the core features they started out with. Okay, great. Thank you guys very much.